Good afternoon, friends. <laughs> Welcome to 4-4. This is our seventh edition. It's crazy. Can't believe it. Um, this afternoon, we're focusing on people who have created incredible resources within our art space globally. Um, and that is today, Oloranke Akinmowo, Asma Walton, and Tiffany Autriana Ward. And today our conversation is called Reflective Resources. Um, this idea that, you know, you see yourself in the resources that you're consuming, um, kind of thinking about it as almost a diet in a way. Um, I think I'll wait for a few more people to come before we start getting into it. Reflective Resources centers on the vision and voices of these three women that I've mentioned and how they've created and galvanized resources for our community. Although each initiative is at a different stage in its life and for clarity, that's the Free Black Women's Library, Black Art Library, and Mayor Projects. They all represent an encounter with inspiration and a reflection of future possibility. I'm excited to speak with each of these ladies today. Um, let's see, 27, I feel like that's enough. Um, so, Ola. Ola Ronke Akimowo is joining us live from Brooklyn. Uh, Ola Ronke Akimowo is an interdisciplinary artist who specializes in collage, paper making, print making, and installations. You'll see she got a nice installation for you to look at when she's talking. Um, in 2015, she started the Free Black Women's Library, an interactive mobile library archive and biblio installation that featured over 2,000 books written by Black women, as well as workshops, performances, film screenings, readings, and radical conversations. Her work has been featured in Teen Vogue, Oprah Magazine, Hyperallergic, Bus Magazine, and the New York Times. She has received artist fellowships and grants from Culture Push, The Laundromat Project, The Blackburn Print Shop, and the Brooklyn Arts Council. I'm so excited to have you this afternoon, Ola. I'm going to unmute you and give you the video spotlight. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Ola, and I'm going to share just a uh, quick slideshow about the Free Black Women's Library, and then we can have a conversation. I'm not a very presentational person. I'm more of a discussion, back and forth, let's all get into it type of popcorn type person. So I'm just going to, this is my first time doing screen share. So I'm going to click on share content. Oh, it says only the host can share in this meeting. Whoops, my bad. <laughs> okay. Fixed. Okay, awesome. Share content. Screen. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to say hello again to everybody who's just joining us. Welcome, welcome, welcome to 244 Reflective Resources. As usual, we love a lively chat, so please, you know, talk to us in the chat. Also, there's a Q&A button toward the bottom of your screen for you to enter any questions that you may have through the course of the conversation. Thanks so much. Ola, take it away. Okay, so do you see my screen? No, ma'am. Oh, sugar, honey, I see. Okay, do you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, awesome. Okay, great. So, um, as has been said, my name is Ola Ronke, and I am from bed -Stuy, Brooklyn. So, in uh, five years ago, the library is celebrating its five-year anniversary. I started a project called the Free Black Women's Library. It is a social art project. It's a, considered a public praxis project. I consider it a Black feminist 
project, uh, community project. It has, it's like an octopus with multiple limbs and legs and things coming out of it uh, as far as like what it represents and what I'm hoping it does for uh, my community and people in general. So one of the guiding ancestors, um, spirit guide, venerated ancestor, mentor in my mind, spiritual mentor in my mind, Audrey Lord. Uh, she's one of the reasons why I started this project. Uh, so this is a quote from her that is one of my favorites. If I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. Right, so the library is connected to the concept of self definition, you know, um, reclaiming who I am as a black woman and what my capabilities are. So, uh, this is a collage that I did in dedication of this same uh, black woman who defined herself as a black lesbian mother warrior poet. So reading these words in her essay collection, Sister Outsider, uh, pretty much inspired me to ask myself, uh, what am I and how do I define who I am? And in this next slide um, is a picture of something that I am, uh, something that I gave birth to the Free Black Women's Library, a mobile library featuring a collection of books written by Black women. Books of every genre you can imagine, from science fiction to poetry to erotica. And every time the library is in a new space, there is a different thing that happens when the library is in that space, a workshop, film screening, performance, uh, book talk featuring authors and radical conversations about anything and everything from Beyonce to Black Panther to gentrification to sexual harassment to police brutality. So here are a couple of pictures of the library in different spaces. This is at Bedvine Brew, which is a really super popular bar in Brooklyn. They have a really nice patio. And they let me use that space for free. Anytime the library is anywhere, it has to be for free because, um, you know, I don't make any money doing this. <laughs> um, the library in 462 Halsey Community Garden, which is a beautiful community garden that has bees and all types of medicinal plants and uh, compost, and they have a farmer's market. So the library was there for uh, Mother's Day weekend, and each time the library gathers, as I said, there's some type of theme or book or author idea we focus on. So for this one, the theme was uh, mothering as a political act and how do our political beliefs uh, influence and shape the way we raise our children and care for them. This is at the library at um, this is when the library was at Concord Baptist Church, which is another iconic location in Bed-Stuy. Um, it is listed as one of the stops on the Underground Railroad. And it's a beautiful, incredibly inclusive church. When we met there, we met on the steps and we talked about All About Love by Bell Hooks, which is a must read. Um, this is at the garden again with Dr. Amy Meredith Cox, where she can talk, she came and she talked to us about her book, Shapeshifters, Black Girls and the Choreography of Citizenship. She lived and worked in Detroit at a residency for young women ages 18 to 25. And she, she's an anthropologist, she's brilliant. She wrote a book about that experience. I think she was there with them for seven years. So, the library is an intergenerational inclusive space for all readers and writers. And by that, I mean that all ages are represented in terms of the book collection and all ages are welcome to be in that space. I mean that all bodies are welcome. I make sure to have the library in a space where if you move with a wheelchair or if you move with a cane or if you're a caregiver for a child and you're moving with a stroller, 
you should be able to enter in and out of that place easily. You should be able to move throughout that space easily. That's incredibly important to me. Um, topics we've discussed, Afrofuturism, spirituality, as I mentioned before, police, bata police brutality, and so on and so forth. Um, some of the authors we've discussed, June Jordan, Maya Angelou, Bell Hooks, you name it, you know, we've got it. We've got Zane, we've got Cola Booth, we've got Roxane Gay, we've got Claudine Rankin, um, we've got Toni Morrison, Gloria Naylor, Alice Walker, Chimamandi Ngozi Adichie, Jamaica Kincaid, Zora Neale Hurston, Ida B. Wells, Zadie Smith, Octavia Butler, and so on and so forth. This is an installation of the library at MoMA PS1, where I did a presentation on the themes of Black feminism and music, and the library was there for a day. The library can be in a space for uh, one day, uh, two weeks, three months. It depends on the space. Um, if it's an art exhibit, it's usually there for a while. So it's an interactive installation and in that for every book you bring, you get to take a book as long as it's a Black woman writer. So you can bring three books and get three new books as long as they are Black women writers. And I take pictures of people with the books they bring and the books they're taking for the archive. Um, just as a way to kind of track to see what people's interests are and if the books that people are people are reading are connected to things that might be going on in the world or if there's like a certain trend in reading and that's interesting um, these are people some people with their trades Sometimes if somebody comes to the library and they don't have a book they get to take one anyway because I just want to give them one. Um, this is at Mokata Museum when we talked about Octavia Butler's book Parable of the Sower, which is another must read. This is at EFA Project Space. This was a long, be uh, beautiful, long exhibit that I got to have in this space. Um, the library was there for three months, January, February, March, and I did programming for all three months while the library lived there, people were welcome to go there, to hang out with the books, take a nap in the space, take pictures, trade books, watch For Color Girls, the original version of For Color Girls on the video monitor, and a small documentary on the video monitor. And yeah, just um, check it out. So that's pretty much it. Um, stay connected to the library through Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. Um, it's the free Black Women's Library on all the platforms. I have a Patreon, which is my main way of funding this project. You can subscribe from anywhere from $2 a month to $50 a month, depending on how generous you're feeling. And there's my contact info at the bottom. And that is the end of my slideshow. Now, how do I get back to Zoom? Let me see. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I do want you to talk a little bit about uh, the grant project that you've been doing. So maybe, maybe yes, we'll come to I that. wanted to talk about that as well. Yeah. Um, because that slideshow is mainly focused on the library and the grant is something that I started in April of this year in response to Corona, um, coronavirus. Um, so basically when this whole world shut down because of this virus, uh, my work shut down as well. And, you know, I leaned into doing uh, meeting meetups and book conversations in the virtual space and also through uh, creating a YouTube channel. So with the YouTube channel, I read short stories written by Black women, then I offer writing prompts and rituals that are inspired by those stories. And that's one aspect of what coronavirus did for me. The second is that I started a mutual aid fund for single Black mothers who are artists, writers, cultural workers, healers, um, people who, you know, work off the books, people who freelance, people who are doing things 
where the main purpose is to bring beauty to the community, to bring creativity, to bring healing, to bring joy, uh, to bring care to the community. And the single Black mothers who are doing this work and at the same time raising children, which is like already exhausting. So, you know, what brought it to mind for me is that's basically what I am. And I thought about the idea of like some of us who can't file for unemployment, you know, and really we're already kind of pinching pennies and um, in a deep sense of like budgeting and hustle and having these like multiple side hustles. So I put the call out there and my initial goal was to give out, I think 10 grants <laughs> initially. And the res response and feedback that I got from the Free Black Women's Library community was so incredible that I raised, I've raised enough money to give out about 120 grants. So, so far I've given out 70 and I'm on my way to giving out the next 50. And I think after that, I might keep going. I'm not sure because it actually is a lot of work um, running a mutual aid fund um so i'm not really sure because i also want to write some things during corona um while the city shut down i want to spend some time like really trying to write some things that have been in my mind for a long time but either way that's a whole nother story um either way the sister outsider artist relief grant is a one-time cash grant of 250 dollars that goes straight to the mamas and I've given a couple of mamas um, 500, depending on their situation. Uh, some people are in dire situations where they need money for medicine, rent, and groceries. And then some people need money for art supplies so they can create new art or they need to get their computer fixed or, you know, things like that. I don't know, how do I get this screen off? What do you mean? mean? Something stop. I don't know. It's my screen is covered, so I can't see I can't see you. Oh. <laughs> and, it's, and it's really frustrating. Especially because you look so pretty with your with your crown on. Oh. Your powdery <laughs> crown. Well, thank you, Ola. Um, so we'll definitely, of course, if you have questions as per our typical protocol here, we do ask that people put questions in the Q&A, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. So please do that. Also, we love screenshots. So take some and tag us. Um, so could all of you please put your handles for your projects and for yourselves in the uh, chat, please. And so next we have the wonderful Asma Walton. Asma Walton is a Detroit native and the founder of the Black Art Library. The Black Art Library is a collection of books she began curating on Black visual arts in early 2020. The goal is to eventually turn this project of books to a lending library to be an educational resource for the Black community first and foremost. Asma has a Master of Arts in Art Politics from New York University and a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Art Education from Michigan State University. She's currently the Romare Bearden Graduate Museum Fellow at SLAM in St. Louis, and was previously the inaugural Key Bank Diversity Leadership Fellow at the Toledo Museum of Art. Super excited to have you here, Asma. I'm very excited for the work that you're doing with Black Art Library. Because um, I think, you know, one of the things that I think about in my work, um, is the idea of a document and just how important that is to the canon, to us really representing our own viewpoints. So very excited for the work you're doing. And I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and talk us through what you're doing. All right. So one, it's it's kind of, it's really nice to, to go after Ola because we can kind of see the contrast between like the time lengths. So she's five years in and I'm five months in. So <laughs> everything is still really new, figuring it out kind of every day, even like something that you said has changed since I first sent you the bio. Um, 
and I kind of started this, I actually have been trying to remember how I came up with starting this project, um, and I really can't remember, but since I am, I'm in museum work, and you know, in museums, there's always that, that lack of representation as far as the audience that comes to the museum and the work that's being displayed. Um, so kind of on my off time, I'm always figuring out like what I can do and how I can use my art education background to kind of spread some of the knowledge that I have that's um, around Black visual arts. So I started this project kind of just, I've always, I've been collecting books on Black visual arts for a couple years, but I never had that many. I would just here and there, I would like, my friends would give me a book for my birthday or like that's what I would tell people to get me, like give me a book. Um, and earlier this year, I was like, well, I could start, you know, collecting more of these books just because I know I have a lot of peer, I'm like the art kind of person out of my friends. so. I always try to use my social media to kind of share some quick information about a work of art by a Black artist or just a little bit about them. And people that are not necessarily in the arts are always, you know, really appreciative that I'm sharing a little bit of that information and that they're learning something new. Um, so I kind of wanted to keep doing that like on a, on a larger scale. So when I first thought of this project, I was like, well, I can just start collecting books and I was really inspired by the Free Black Women's Library um, and kind of, how, you know, I tried to do like a deep dive into looking like, okay, how are people creating these kind of libraries and how are they, you know, how are they functioning? Because it's, I was like, okay, I want to do something like this, but I don't really know how to do it. So I kind of, you know, was doing my own little research as much as I could, because there's not a whole lot of information out there about projects that are kind of similar. Um, and I was like, okay, I, I have my idea. I think I know what I want to focus on. I think I know what I want to do. So I was like, I'm just going to start buying books and we'll, we'll go from there. So the first book that I bought, I was really excited about. Um, and it is a catalog from Buford Delaney's 1978 retrospective at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And I got it for $50 and it's pretty much brand new. And I was really, really excited about it. Um, and my initial kind of idea was that I wanted people to be able to borrow these books and kind of take them on their own and kind of, you know, be able to learn from them and look in them. And over time, which is the past few months, like as I've been collecting, I've been thinking, okay, I was like, okay, well, a lending library might not be the best idea because some of these books, it's like, what if I don't get them back? Especially the ones that. I might not ever find again. So I've been kind of thinking, I was like, okay, well, now I'm in a space where it would be a non-lending library. Um, the physical space would kind of act as a reading room um, because I think that's a way where people can have a space where they can come in and they're welcome and they can spend as much time as they want with these books. If, you know, in the future, if I have like, a copy machine in that space they can like make copies of pages and they can you know do what they will like with that information um and that's kind of where i'm at right now with what i want to do i'm giving myself like three ish years to have a physical space for this project but i know i want it to be based in detroit um because of course that's where i'm from but that's also i feel like detroit has kind of a lack of resources for kind of visual arts as far as education goes. Um, so I grew up in Detroit Public Schools and Detroit Public Schools has great performing arts programs um, in some of their schools, but we didn't have any visual arts programs. So we didn't have painting classes or ceramics or kind of anything in that realm. And I had, I had art in, kindergarten and first grade but I think that was it that's that was kind of where where my art education stopped on that end and when I got to Michigan State I was in the art ed program and I was in a cohort of like 14 people and I was the only black person in my cohort and 
they had all come from schools where they had visual arts in their schools their whole lives. Like they had kilns in their classrooms and they had, you know, all these really like amazing classes. And I was really, really surprised because I didn't realize that other students actually had those resources. And even some high schools have art history classes. And that was really surprising to me. And I just, was thinking like, well, Detroit doesn't really have that built into the school system. So I think there's a way that students need to be able to receive that information because Detroit has a huge talent pool. Like there, people in Detroit are extremely talented, but the resources aren't always there and they're not always accessible. Um, so creating this project is me trying to create that resource um and of course focus on black art especially because detroit is basically the the what well, is the blackest city in the united states is 82 percent black um so i think having a resource like this based in detroit it makes sense not only because that's where i'm from but because of detroit in general and its population um so that's kind of where I am with it right now as you know it's it's always changing I'm always trying to figure out the best way to do it when I started out I was kind of buying all the books on my own um and then I was like well I guess I can see if people want to you know donate books to me so I kind of I was like okay how can I do that so I made an Amazon wish list which eh, Amazon but I was trying to figure out a way I could get strangers to be able to send me books without having to give them my address. So it just seemed like the safest way where I didn't have to give all these people my address and they could just pick a book that's on the list and they can send it without even knowing exactly where it's going. Um, so I started to get a few people donating books and one of my very first donors is actually on this Zoom call but I will keep my donors anonymous. Um, but it was just really exciting to start seeing um, people actually supporting what I was doing. And it kind of was like, okay, well, I'm doing something that, that people enjoy and that they think is a good thing. Um, so time has been going by. I've been getting more donations and more donations. I'm kind of stopping getting donations because now I'm going to have to move and I'm going to have to move all of these books that I've collected over the past few months. So I'm going to halt on <laughs> getting books. But it even just the Instagram page, which is um, black, just Black Art Library on Instagram, um, people have just been enjoying that as a resource just as far as the pictures because now they can see books that they might want to buy might want to add to their collection. I've been really getting a lot of art teachers who have been following my page um, and actually a lot of um, white art teachers that are finding these resources and they're like really excited that they can kind of add these books to their their classrooms. Um, and one woman, she, she messaged me and she was saying like, I'm going to send this to all of my teacher friends um, just so they can see some of these books that they can have for their students and that was really exciting for me especially because I have an art education background but I knew I didn't want to teach in the traditional classroom setting that was I was never interested in that and I was the only one in my cohort that was like no I'm not going to get my teaching certification because it's a waste of time but so I've been kind of figuring out what I could still do in that realm and this was kind of it just feels right and kind of feels like the perfect thing um, for me to be doing. And I'm really excited to kind of see how it's gonna continue to grow, especially next month when I, well actually this month when I move back to Detroit and kind of see what kind of things I can be doing once I'm, I'm home um, and pretty much just gonna keep collecting, keep collecting and then Someday I'm gonna have enough money and I'm gonna buy a building and then the rest will be history. Um, actually, as of yesterday, I started a, um, a GoFundMe for a book fund um, to kind of help me buy more books. Um, 
I like doing this as opposed to using Amazon because if I get the money directly, I plan to buy from black bookstores. Um, so that's the goal. So the GoFundMe is, it's in the link of the bio of the Black Art Library page on Instagram. Um, and I think you should put it in the chat. In the well. chat. Let's see. Okay. After after I finish talking, I would like go. I'll probably go get the link and yeah, the link mm -hmm. in the chat too. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I am. It's still very new, but I'm really excited about it. So as you yeah. should be. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Asma. Um, I'm super excited to, to bring us all back into conversation together, but we have one more person to speak about their work right now. Tiffany Autriana Ward is an independent curator and cultural producer based in Baltimore and New York. Ain't you finna move? You should have sent me that. In 2019, she founded Mayor Residency as part of Mayor Projects, a residency with a focus on supporting and connecting artists of African descent between the United States Latin America and the Caribbean. In its inaugural year, Ward partnered with Sunspot Studios, shout out to my brother, Takala, to host Baltimore born artist Jarrell Gibbs, shout out to Jarrell too, and Dominican American artist Raylis Vasquez, love Raylis as well, in a two week residency created to highlight and connect artists to the city of Baltimore. Recent awards include the Intercultural Development Grant. Micah MFA Graduate Merit Scholarship, the Leslie King Hammond Graduate Fellowship, and the Micah Graduate Research Development Grant. At Micah, she served as a Graduate Studies Curatorial Fellow and the Student Representative in the Vice Protovost Search Committee. During the past 10 years, Ward has centered the stories of the African diaspora through her academic and professional pursuits, which have taken her to Brazil, Puerto Rico, and throughout the continental United States. From 2015 to 2018, she ran a bilingual Portuguese and English online journal, Cores Brilhantes, a contemporary online space for Afro-Brazilian art. Since founding the journal, Tiffany has also been a contributing writer for Afropunk, Sugarcane Magazine, and Baltimore Magazine, as well as assisted artists from across the diaspora with public relations and marketing support. She is a 2020 MFA Curatorial Practice graduate from MICA. Clap for her, because she just graduated. Um, she received her BA in history from Manhattanville College in 2011 with a focus on African diasporic studies. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself now um, and talk to us about what you're working on. Hey, um, so I just want to make sure everybody can hear me okay. Just thumbs up. It's good. All right, awesome. Um, I want to thank you so much for including me in this. Um, and it's been absolutely amazing to hear about uh, everyone's work. And just to update, so I'm currently in Chicago and I'm moving to Puerto Rico at the end of the year. So that's where, so I'll be based between Puerto Rico and New York. Um, but I started this residency, Mare residency, and Mare is Latin for sea. Um, sea is in water, not vision. But um, we, what we wanted to do is me and two other writers and curators, uh, Nora Ariata Fernandez and Tatiana Scalaro, and they're from Colombia and Brazil. What we wanted to do was to connect um, artists of the African diaspora in the Americas and what each of us uh, were brought to this space because we were seeing artists in different spaces who were coming up like conceptually with similar themes in their work and asking similar questions, but they had, they didn't know each other, but they were still connected thematically. And so I was thinking of a way to um, further these connections and to also expand the conversation on the diaspora because um, basically growing up, I'm originally from San Francisco, California, and I moved to New York and when I was 18, and I stayed there until I was 25. Um, and, but, but growing up in San Francisco, basically all the black people that I grew up around or all the people that I recognized as black were African-American um, or from the continent. And so when I moved to New York and I started seeing people who were coming up to me and speaking in Spanish, um, I was, you know, just really, confused as to who these people were that looked like me and didn't speak English and didn't sound like they had learned Spanish. 
Um, and so I started learning more about Caribbean history and the actual, the reality of the slave trade. Um, Cause in California, it's very easy to just believe that it was from West Africa to Mississippi and that was it. Um, and so over time, you know, I've also wanted to, I, I think that, that conversation was specifically limited um, growing up because they don't want the, the larger powers that be don't want us to know about each other um, and to connect with each other and to see how our oppression is all tied. Um, so basically with my work from loving artists and loving art, I've found a way to connect all of the things that I'm trying to do through art. Um, and I started, the idea for the residency came because when I moved to Baltimore, I was going back to New York and a friend of mine had started a residency for Brazilian artists. And I would go when there was an Afro-Brazilian artist that I knew, I would go to the city and I would meet up with them. And then I noticed that because they didn't, because there was the language barrier, they weren't able to connect with the city as much. And like they were siloed out and kind of just like meeting up with other Brazilians in the city. And I really wanted them to see, you know, like African-American culture here because me studying abroad in Brazil was so impactful to everything I've learned like about myself and about the diaspora. Um, and I, so I started saying like, wouldn't it be really, you know, interesting and cool to have artists from different parts of the diaspora come to Baltimore and to see a city that's both historically black, but also a city that's um, disenfranchised in the way that, you know, people speak about the city and, and that's within the black community itself. And like sometimes, um, you know, just some of the feedback that I would get when I said I was moving there because I moved to Baltimore in 2016. Um, and so for me, the residency is just as much about highlighting the work of the artists as it is about highlighting these locales that are historically Black, where Black people have survived and Black people have built the culture of these cities. Um, and so the residency is also nomadic. So there's the version in Baltimore, which will be uh, repeated again this year. And I have three artists that I am announcing at the end of this month. And then there is a version that's going to be in Luisa, Puerto Rico, which is um, out, outside of San Juan. And Luisa is a historically Black part of Puerto Rico. And it's a beautiful, beautiful town. Um, and a lot of like Black culture there. And then after that, we'll be going to Trinidad and eventually Brazil. So... You know, I think that it's my work in general is about shifting narratives. Um, and I also, because I am coming from, you know, an American perspective, I'm thinking of ways to make it. Oh, shout out from Baltimore. Hi, Latoya. Um, thinking about ways to make this conversation so that it's not just American centered and it's not, you know, American ideas of blackness solely um, because we are all black throughout this diaspora. And so what does that mean? And what are ways, how, how do we use art to survive and to further our culture and to honor our heritage? Um, so I am looking forward to announcing the artists at the end of this month for this residency. Uh, it's three women and one of them is in the chat. <laughs> um, and it's going to be because of Corona, unfortunately, the third artist is actually an artist from Brazil, but she won't be able to come to Baltimore. Um, so she's gonna be a virtual artist in residence. Um, and so once we're announcing that, and then we're also looking to fundraise too, because I have been self-funded or got some um, you know, funding from MICA because of the first residency was a part of my thesis. So, I don't know how long I talked, um, but I'm super interested um, in questions about my work and talking further. Well, all right. Um, if you two, Ola and Asma, would unmute yourselves. Um, so this is our moment to shine together. Okay, so let's um, have a conversation about what you're all doing in tandem. And I think um, what, a lot of what I'm hearing is very much about this sort of ethos of generosity, this idea of really wanting to create resources wherein you see yourself, 
ultimately. Um, so I just wonder, I mean, you've obviously spoken a bit about how you have come to these places, but talk to us about where you want to go, where do you want to take these ideas and projects in the future? Is that for all of us? Oh. <laughs> uh, should we go in the same order? Whoever wants to go can go. All right, I'll go. So I have big thoughts, big dreams. Um, glamorous life is all about me. I would like to have a couple of things for the Free Black Women's Library. I would like for it to be a mobile library in that there's some type of bus or van or Winnebago of some kind that I can trick out with books uh, that can be driven to different parts of the community, uh, in the city, outside of the city, um, you know, a legitimate old school bookmobile. And I also would like to have a brick and mortar location that can be in Bed-Stuy where it started. Uh, but part of, part of what inspired me to start this project is the gentrification that is going on in Bed-Stuy and how through that violent process, black people are being erased um, and pushed out. So I would like to have a brick and mortar uh, location in Bed-Stuy where people can come and be in the library and, and use it in the same way that you would use a traditional library for meetings, for book clubs, for tutoring sessions, for, you know, uh, watching films, for sitting and reading books, for using the internet, you know what I'm saying, for making copies. Like, and they can also be a member of the space and take books out and bring books back. You know, um, there's books I have in the library, just in terms of thinking of what was said earlier, that are so classic and so precious and so one of a kind and so important. Those books don't ever go anywhere. People are always invited to look at them, to take pictures of them, to experience them. But there's like a collection that it stays within the library. Then there are books that go in and out constantly. So that's the second layer of the dream. <laughs> the third is something I'm working on now, which is the free Black, Black Women's Library app, which is an app that people can put on their phone and they can use it to connect to my work, connect to the books, connect to different ideas around Black womanhood. Because I'm tired of being banned off of Facebook and Instagram and not Speak having- Speak on it. I meant to tell you to say that. Because we got to talk about that and not have it access shady. to my content. So I want to leave these social media platforms alone because the main reason I started the library on social media is because I have no money, I have no budget. You know, if it weren't for my Patreon, patrons on Patreon, I wouldn't be able to do this. So they the one, they're the ones that have kept me going. They're the ones who helped me pay for transportation, pay for my PO box, pay for, um, you know, when I have volunteers who help me come to deliver the books, I get, I make sure they have meals and a Metro card to get home. You know, I have a lot of expenses and thanks to the patrons, that's how things are paid for, you know, but how I spread the word is through um, Facebook and through Instagram and through Tumblr and through Twitter. Like that's how I communicate with people and that's how I let people know where the library is gonna be and this is what book we're talking about this month and these are the books that just came in and this book is about to come out. You guys should really read it or I just finished this. So when I get kicked off these platforms, it feels really horrible, <laughs> you know? Because not only do I not have access to the Free Black Women's Library community, all my content I've been creating for the past five years is gone. And it's like, I really work hard on creating good content, you know? I spend time on it. So I want an app where if people wanna connect to the library, all they need to do is put that app on their phone. 
So if Facebook tries to disappear me or if Instagram tries to disappear me again, I won't be stressed. <laughs> you know, and it might seem like a small thing uh, because it's like, oh, social media is superficial. It's so silly. But when that's your main way of sharing your art with the world, it can feel like a violation and it can feel like censorship, you know? And there's a lot, the first time it happened to me, I came, come to find out that there's a lot of black women that this happens to. And I don't know if we're targeted or hacked or whatever, but a lot of black women get banned from Facebook. And once you're banned from Facebook, you're banned from Instagram because it's the same folks. So anywho, so those are my dreams. The bookmobile, the book mortar location, and an app. If anybody's if in this chat that wants to help me with any of those things, um, I put my email in the chat. Please contact me because I am all about collaborative work. You know, I'm not trying. I tried to do this ish by myself for years. And anybody who's starting out like five months in or a year in, please don't try to do all this by yourself. Please, when people reach out to help you, take their help. <laughs> Collaboration is key because you have your one perspective and then other folks come in and they give you a perspective and they can help ease that burden and ease that stress and also help you feel less alone. Like my patrons affirm me because it's like, oh, you believe in my project. You believe in my work. That keeps me motivated. So that's my, those are my dreams. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, Asma and Tiffany, did you want to speak to that question? Uh, so as far as the future goes, um, you know, I definitely want to continue to spread the residency. And I don't think, I don't know if I said this part, but the residency also, Baltimore was a place where it was like a home base, but in other spaces, I partner with other organizations. That's the model. Um, so I just want to see that grow forward. And then also Mare itself is, uh, we're trying to build it into a larger platform, including a publishing platform. So I'm working with um, a really cool, this is so cool how it's all aligned, right? But I'm working with um, a really cool writer and performance artist, and we'll be publishing something later on this year. Um, and so I just, you know, I just want to see more support and then also, you know, more financial freedom to be able to support these projects. So I think about how much, how, you know, I, the first residency I did with like less than $2,000. So just like imagining so much more funding and like what I could do with that too and what we could all do with that. So that's what I see in the future. Thank you. For me, one, sorry, my cat is, she, she won't leave me alone. Um, but I kind of said, I said this earlier, but just the, you know, like a brick and mortar location, that is the next kind of big goal. Like I'm, right now I'm really just focused on getting as many books as I can, but after so long, it's going to be like, well, now I, these books are taking up everywhere and I need somewhere to put them so that's something I'm kind of thinking about at the same time um figuring out how I can make that happen but also just getting the word kind of out there about what I'm doing um so continuing to do that so we'll see a year from now what what things look like so yeah brilliant so um something and this is such a wonderful segue so thank both of you for um both uh, Ola and Tiffany for sort of mentioning this partnership aspect. So, so much of what all of you are doing, partnerships are so absolutely essential to that. And I wonder about your process for sort of building your partnerships because it's so integral into what you're doing. And sort of, because um, I think partnerships can be one of these things that is difficult. It's essential, but it's not easy, right? Um, so what are, what are sort of like, maybe if you have best practices in terms of how you go about developing those? Um, I can answer. Um, I don't know that I've thought about it in as concretely of a way before, but um, 
for me, it's about intuition and it's about people having similar, not just goals, but also similar ethics. Um, because I know for me with talking about black art, there can be a, a sort of like seen aspect to some things where like people's motivations are different than mine. So I try to find people who are like really about the art and the culture. And, um, and I've been really fortunate to find people who are like very, very supportive. Um, you know, like Takala is definitely one of them, but, and I think also something that's helped me is knowing exactly what it is that I want. So even sometimes if partnership is just something like talking, like talking to somebody who has, who's helps me like flesh out my ideas more or somebody who will, who I can trust when they say like, mm, maybe you should do it a different way that that's coming from a genuine place and not a like, cause I don't want to see you do it and me not do it, you know? So I, that's, I guess my best practices. Ola, you just go smile. You're not gonna. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't want to be, I know I wasn't sure if Asma was going to say something cause I went first already. So I was trying to like fall back, but you know, I'm kind of the same way uh, as far as uh, what Tiffany said. I can definitely piggyback off that. You know, I want to connect with people who have um, similar ethics, similar principles. I have, you know, I have like certain ideas in place that are concrete when it comes to the library and where it will be and what I need it to represent when it's out in the world. And, you know, there are some things I'm flexible on, but there are some things that there's, there are like 10 major points that are like super important. And some of them are the ones I mentioned earlier, which is that it has to be an inter intergenerational space. Um, it has to be a space that's accessible for all bodies. Um, you know, I say the library is anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-capitalist, it's pro-black, it's pro-creativity it's pro-radical thought, you know, I want it to be a resource, I want it to be, um, I don't necessarily believe in safe spaces, for Black women especially, but I want to make it as safe as possible, um, it needs to be a Black woman-centered space, always, the conversations are led by back Black women, always, you know, and everyone's welcome to come to the library. All ages, races, and genders are welcome to come and to trade books and to take part in whatever is happening. But when you come to the library, you're agreeing to those ideas in those terms. Um, you know, and I've had uh, pretty good luck so far uh, because there is an appeal to the idea about it being so expansive. You know, uh, no matter what your reading personality is, there's something there for you. And there's very few people who will boldly say, I don't like to read. I mean, except for Kanye West, but you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> there's like, most people, even if they don't necessarily read voraciously everyone loves a good story people love being read to people love engaging with others so sometimes people come just to flirt and be cute and make new friends um and i want it to be a space that feels nurturing and healing and joyful and vibrant so if you're somebody who wants to collaborate with me on these things then you know let's get it popping that's how I feel. Um, you know, every once in a while, there have been some like bumps and bruises, but I learn through those bumps and bruises. So it's all good. Asma, do you want to add something? Well, no, I haven't really done any collaborations yet. So I'm, I'm kind of just like listening to what you guys are saying, kind of thinking about it but um like I have been like recently approached by um by uh the founder of it 
it's uh, a literary arts journal um, for it's specifically for people of color um, because and founded by a black woman because it's really hard for writers of color to get their work published. So she kind of started it and she kind of reached out to me. Um, and in a few weeks, I'm going to be reading some books on their Instagram. So that's kind of my first <laughs> collaboration. So that should be fun. But it was, you know, it, it just felt like a genuine kind of connection. And it seems like it would be a really good fit. So I'm excited about that. And after that, I guess I'll have more insight on how, you know, the process of collaborating really goes. So. Yeah, one thing I'll say is like when it comes to collaborating, uh, it should always be fun. Let me not say should, but it has to be fun. And it can't feel like you're creating more work for yourself because that defeats the purpose. So I like that word fun a lot. So when I get invited to collaborate with someone on something, if it feels good, like someone mentioned, mentioned intuition, like if it automatically feels good and makes me want to smile and get excited in my body, then it's, I feel like that's a good collaboration. I also want to address something that you said, Ola. Um, you said that you had good luck. I don't believe in that um, because you are actually setting the standard for what you want to have come to you because that's what you're putting out. So it's not luck. It's a matter of intention. Um, and I think if I may just say something else here in terms of thinking about partnerships, you have to also be thinking about, as uh, both Tiffany and Ola said, alignment. You're thinking about that, but you're also thinking about like, is this a healthy step for whatever you desire to have your project grow into? Um, and I think that's a critical element to think about as well. So uh, that brings me to my next question. One of the things that I really would love to hear from each of you about is what has been the sort of most meaningful and impactful interaction that you've had with someone that you're serving or that you are being supported by? Faces, <laughs> your faces. <laughs> um, so I'll, I will go um, first, well one, just running like the Instagram page for the Black Art Library, it kind of, I'm always really happy to see like, um, to see like some of the comments that I get and some of the messages um, because they do just make me feel really supported and like what I'm doing is important. Um, and then yesterday, like when I had just posted the, the GoFundMe, so it's, it hasn't even been up like 24 hours and I got a hundred dollar donation from the woman I supervise who was my supervisor when I was at the Toledo Museum of Art um which I didn't even expect it um and I texted her and I told her thank you and she was like it's like what you're doing is really great and she was like I, I saw the Black Art Library on Instagram I didn't even realize it was something that you were doing um so it was just nice to see that and be kind of supported in that way just because I had never really I had never talked to her about the project um but that you know that hundred dollar donation that that felt nice so um I think for me I was, so for the, the residency, we did a, docu a short documentary um, and I was recently applying for a grant for this next batch and I was thinking about, you know, like things that I could say about the residency and like the impact that I think that it had on the artists and uh, Baltimore community that, you know, uh, participated in some of the events. And I was thinking like, wasn't there something that Jarrell said about, you know, the, the residency made him feel, you know, stronger and more prideful of Baltimore. And I went back and watched the, the documentary. Um, and he had said that the residency itself and like the attention to Baltimore made him feel like more proud to be from the city and that I could do that. And that, um, that, you know, I was thinking about another artist that I brought for the residency who's actually from Puerto Rico. And he was talking about how, you know, when he thinks about Baltimore, 
he'll think about his experience coming to visit the artist. And for me, that was really important, especially because, you know, now he doesn't have to say the wire every time he thinks about Baltimore, which is what I always get whenever I say I live there. Um, but that it was just this, you know, this powerful black experience where everybody was able to connect and, um, I don't, I don't know. It's just everything about that experience was just so meaningful for me. Thank you. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> I want to make sure I got it right because my yes. answer is, my answer is long winded and I'm trying to make, make it shorter in my mind. I mean, it ain't gotta be unless it's like going to be a 20 minute answer. Um, no. So the question is, what has been the most sort of meaningful interaction that you've had either with someone who you are serving with your project or someone who is supporting you to do okay. your project? Okay. That's what I thought it was. Um, it's so many. I can't. It's, there's been so many. Um, you know, I started this library five years ago exactly with 100 books on a Brooklyn brownstone stoop. I danced to this song, River, by the twins, Ibeji. You guys know that song? I called myself doing a dance in honor of Oshun. And oh, the girl. Goddess, and the goddess of creativity within all Black women. And my people in the neighborhood were like, what is she doing? What's going on? And they would stop and watch. And I would say, these are books by Black women. If you have a book, by, if you want one, you need to go get a book written by a black woman, bring me one and we'll trade. And there was a girl there who was probably six or seven who spent time looking through all the books and then went home, got a book, came back like an hour, maybe two hours later and traded a book. And that was the first book trade that I had with this project. And she still comes to the library five years later. She's older now. She's graduated to chapter books. She's taller. She's still adorable. You know, it's like, that's amazing. Like, I just, I get teary thinking about it, you know? So I've had that moment so many times. Like, I've had that moment with women who are looking for books for their children. Like, they've just finished their MFA in, like, Black feminist studies. So they bring, you know, a book, um, you know, they'll bring a book like Angela Davis's Race, War, and Class, and they'll trade it for like, you know, Nappy Hair by Bell Hooks. You know, you have a group of Black women who bicycle together, and they'll make the library the last stop on their all-day bicycle ride. You have best friends who come from the Bronx every month. They come to the library, they trade books, they go have brunch, and they drink. Like, there are all these different aspects of my community, um, Black people, book lovers, readers who just, you know, they're amazing. I get books from publishers. Um, I get books from writers. Um, I was asked to speak at the Brooklyn Museum um, on when Toni Morrison passed away. I was asked to give a speech to introduce her documentary. I was like, ah, this is incredible. It was like a full moon. Um, so I did this ritual out in honor of her passing. Um, it's just been incredible. Um, I feel deeply supported by uh, patrons, by book lovers, by writers, by readers. I feel really honored when people write me on Instagram and say, you know, I'm a black girl struggling with depression and anxiety and low self-esteem. Can you recommend some books that I can read that might be able to help me? I'm like, I feel so honored. Like, you really think I know something? Okay, let me give you something, you know? It's amazing. Um, and then more so recently with the Sister Outside of Relief grant, being able to give these women who feel like nobody thinks about them um, just some cash to just get them over this corona hump. Or maybe it was a hump that was already there before corona. 
you know, being able to just send the money straight to them. No middleman, no whatever, just here's $250 so you can put it on that phone bill, girl. You know what I'm saying? Pay that internet, you know? Get yourself some some almond milk for your smoothie. You give yourself a little peace of mind. You know, it's amazing. And I'm just a go-between. Like, people are, like, giving me money to distribute this money. And the fact that people trust me enough to do that is a huge honor. And I'm just really humble and really grateful. And it just reminds me that none of us really know the impact that we can have on another person and the domino effect of having an idea and making it a reality and how that can just blossom and bloom into new realities for other people. There are five other free black women library branches in other parts of the country uh, started by women who were inspired by my work. So there's a free black women's library Atlanta, a free black women's library Detroit, a free Black Women's Library in Richmond, there's one in LA, and there's one in Houston. And they're all run in the exact same way for the exact same purpose. So that's really special as well. Told you it was a long answer. <laughs> did I complain? I certainly <laughs> did not. Um, so I want to... Uh, just maybe take a moment to start looking through some of the questions that have been answered. If people have additional uh, questions, please do drop them in the Q&A. Um, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your first name. Zinnia Rowe has said, it's clear to me that we Black women are not owners of street side public venues. Should we not consider churches owned by the community as the brick and mortar spaces through which to set up shop? Ola, Brooklyn for one, has been known as the borough of the Blacks and the borough of churches. I mean, if I may, I think that that's a kind of um, it's a dicey question because people have a lot of interesting relationships with the church. Um, so that's not always an option for people. And it's certainly not always an option wherein the leadership of a church is wanting to align with certain things. That's just my take, my thought initially. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, the, um, the Free Black Women's Library has been at Concord Baptist Church, but that is because that is an uh, inclusive, purposely inclusive church. You know, I felt safe taking the library there because I've been to that church. I've heard uh, Pastor Simpson speak. You know, they're very, they're very queer friendly. They're, you know, they're not, I mean, sometimes church can feel oppressive depending on how you live and move in your body. And Concord is not that type of church. They're very open and welcoming. And that's the main reason that I felt comfortable bringing the library there was because I knew that the, any, the people who come to the library would be welcome there. And it was a really deep and powerful conversation because it was a cross section of ages, genders, um, ideas. There were atheists in the room and hardcore Christians. And we had a deep conversation about love and, um, you know, how living in a racist, capitalist, heterosexist patriarchy um, influences our ability to love each other in a way that's truly. Uh, where we get to tr feel truly vulnerable, like how does that impact? And it was it was awesome, but yeah, church is definitely um, yeah, it can be challenging to be in a church space. Yeah, um, I'm also thinking about access, right? And I know Ola, you've already said that so much of what you're doing is thinking about that. And I don't just mean like physical access. I mean, for you, Tiffany and Asma, how are you thinking about ways that you can actually make your projects a resource for people who are differently abled and all of these kinds of things? Uh, 
All right, let me get myself. Um, so one thing I've kind of been thinking through is that, okay, eventually once once I do have this physical space, um, there still needs to be a way for people to access it that cannot actually get to the physical space. Um, and for one, that's it's still going to have to exist online in a different form um, beyond an Instagram page. Like there's going to have to be some kind of website that can still kind of be as expansive as possible. Like, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, maybe one day, but being able to digitize every book that I have in the collection and put it on the internet, like that's, yeah, that, who knows if something like that can happen, but in a perfect world, something like that um, is what I would want to be able to see. But then even beyond that, it's something you still have to think about, even something existing online, because something that became really apparent with uh, COVID-19 was the lack, um, that some people lack that access to internet, a constant internet connection. So it's, it's something that you, I don't know, that I'm always going to have to be thinking about and figuring out ways to still be able to reach, um, to reach everyone. And maybe it means that okay, they're not coming to me, but I can go, go out to other places as well. So it's going to have to be a multifaceted project. Um, when I think about accessibility, I think about it in on multiple levels. Um, so I think as far as with, you know, differently abled um, people, I think that that's something that I would work out with the physical space that I'm hosting the residency at. And like, that's something that's absolutely essential um, as far as, you know, having visitors come in and even the artists that I work with. Um, but I think also about accessibility too is, I, it's, for me, it's about the community that I build in the places where I am. Um, so I think about in Baltimore, the art scene can be really segregated um, and purposely closed off to people who are uh, not white. So when I th think about, you know, the community I built in Baltimore and when I had different people come to the show that we had as a result of the residency and having it you know, like that meant that I was reaching out to people from all throughout the city, like not just people that were connected with MICA or arts institutions. Um, and I mean, and I think this is a question that I don't fully have the answer to, but that I'm constantly working through. Um, so hopefully that answered the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a final question. I don't know if anyone else has questions again. Oh, thank you, Darla. Amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Darla has asked, are you thinking about the form your archive is taking and will take? How can supporters or collaborators help care for your preserving your hard work? Well, in terms of the accessibility question, um, you know, like I said earlier, and like Tiffany had said, there's different levels to it. And one of the ones that's important is different bodies being able to move in and out of the space and throughout the space freely, uh, but also that the library is always free. You know, the library was that uh, Afropunk, um, one summer and I realized that if you didn't have money to get a ticket to get into Afropunk, that meant that you can't, you couldn't experience the library at Afropunk. So I don't do Afropunk anymore, you know, and whenever the library is invited to be in any space, I make sure to um, let the people know who invited me that you can't charge for people to have access to these books and look at these books. So 
even if you may not have a book to trade, you should still be able to experience it. So that's really important. Um, and one of the reasons why I want the app is so that people who are not in bed in Brooklyn, in New York City, can still kind of experience what's happening at the library. So that there's, you know, there's different types of accessibility. Um, as far as what people can do, <laughs> um, so many things, um, you know, I need help with technology. I need help building a, a website, making the app. Um, I need access to space once the city shutdown is over. Um, I need uh, an intern who can help me figure out how to make this project uh, more efficient. Um, there's so many things that could go on and on and on in terms of that question and uh, what I need. But right now, more than anything, I guess, uh, this is gonna sound capitalist, but I need money. <laughs> I'm trying not to say it, but I don't know how else to say it, but I need money, you know, um, to, to do the thing that it's really going to help the library thrive and run in a way, in the way that it's supposed to, uh, you know, in the way that libraries and cultural institutions uh, work for society and for community. So we need to find it. Um, can I add something? Yes, please. <laughs> so, because I, I was thinking about that too, um, as far as accessibility. So for me, when, before I started the residency, what I did for a year was I did artist interviews. Um, and I have, and what I did with the artist interviews was to see what, what artists in general and then what black artists felt they needed more at residencies and like the importance of residencies, both for connecting with other artists as far as growing. And so one of the things that's super important to me is that there's, the artists don't pay to come because most, a lot of residencies do charge. And I think that it would be, for me, like it would be unfair um, if I was asking artists, black artists from throughout the diaspora to pay to come to different places to be in a residency. Um, so that's why my model is specifically about making it accessible for artists from different backgrounds and also from, for artists who don't speak English and because in different places that can be, um, that can be because of class that you actually have access to learn English. So that's something that I'm thinking about and working through as well for future residencies. So I second that. I don't wanna be capitalist either, but we do need funding. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, obviously we, we are living and working and building and in some ways trying to break out of a capitalist paradigm, but that doesn't mean that you don't have things that keep you in place and needing money is certainly one of them. Um, I don't know if uh, Asma, you wanted to answer that question at all? Um, I, I just kind of agree with what both of them were saying. I do need Fair enough. <laughs> um, so Maria has asked a question, Maria Elino. Museums like MoMA PS1 charge visitors. Is that a question? I guess it's a question. There's a question mark. How did you deal with that when you had an installation there? Also for clarity, just in case no one knows this, suggested donation is usually the case at most of these places. So you actually could probably just walk in there for free if you want to. Yeah, the events that uh, the library participated in at MoMA were free. Um, I, the library was part of uh, the New York Art Book Fair, which is free. And the library was part of um, like a day in black music, tribute to Elaine Brown type thing, and that was free, so. So wait a minute, now I have a follow-up question. They didn't offer you like a budget or anything? to get the books there? Maybe? Oh yeah, um, okay. whenever, I'm, whenever I'm invited, this is, this is 
the library's bread and butter, right? The library's bread and butter, what helps pay the bills is Patreon. And whenever I'm invited to bring the library anywhere, if, if I'm asked to do a presentation or a workshop, I get an honorarium for that. Okay. So I, I wanted to make sure that we spelled that out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's important. Yeah, I get a um, nice honorarium and you know, that's that's money that where I'm paid for my labor, um, for my creative labor. And for the time I spend researching, creating slideshows, creating a book list, you know, so people definitely be getting their money's worth, okay? People walk away learning things. <laughs> no, that's but, um, right. Yeah. Um, so know, I try not to have the library at museums and art galleries and colleges and things like that every month. You know, I work very hard at having the library at, you know, barber shops and vintage clothing stores and the playground and the bus stop and the laundromat because I, I don't want to just have it be consumed and used by academic, like artsy folks. You know, I mean, I love academic artsy folks. Yeah. But I also want the random woman who's going to bodega to just get a ginger ale to stop and say, oh, what's going on here? What you, what you doing with all these books out here? You know, I, I want to engage with, I, I want the library to have a relationship with everyone. So, mm -hmm. you know, but those museums definitely, sometimes they give me some good coins. Sometimes they even provide transportation. They'll pick me up with all the books. They'll help me set up. They'll help me break down. Some institutions are much more supportive than others, but it's uh, um it's it's fine. Good. Um, so we have another question from Aza. Are you able to support yourself solely from these projects? No. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we knew that, but I think maybe that's also an, well. I'll just wait. <laughs> wow. It's just going to keep going. Okay. Um, I think that's an important question just in that um, the nature of the beast is such that we're not able to just do one thing. Um, but, you know, this was not posed to me, so I'm going to not talk anymore. Can't with you. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm trying to get enough funding for the residency that I'll be able to move around um, and support it in different spaces as well as, you know, pay myself. Because I'm, even when I'm not physically at the with the residents, like right now, for example, the residency is going to be in October, but I'm still working on it every day. So, you know, and I think, so that's, I'm trying to get to that, but I've only been doing this for a year. So yeah. we'll see. Ask me. Anyway. I think um, valuing your own labor is also important in these processes. And it's, I mean, I, I think um, in particular in this moment, especially it's a, it's a conversation that we have to have, not just externally, but internally as well within ourselves and within our community and just thinking about the ways that we show up for ourselves individually as like people, particularly, um, you know, in a place where, you know, people will run roughshod all over you if you let them. So um, the yeah. question is in what place, is- In a place where black women's creative labor, yeah. emotional, emotional labor yes. is, not, is not valued. Yes. You know? and is not seen as the precious resource that it is right. for, you know, racist reasons, sexist reasons, but also somewhat classist reasons. Yes. I am not a master librarian scientist. I'm not sure if that would make a difference, but. I know, honestly don't know if it would. I don't know if it would. You know, um, but I work very hard to do a lot of research and make sure that my work is legitimate as possible. 
and I haven't made any money doing this, but the fact that I'm now able to at least not come out of pocket to pay for things does feel like a win, you know, and if I'm able to get to the point where I'm making money doing this, that would be amazing. That would be incredible. But my main goal with the library is that it just pays for itself and I'm, and I'm able to actually hire a person to help me run it so that I can focus on the other things that I feel like I was meant to do creatively. So that's the dream. And it shall be so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Nathaniel said, as someone with an MLS who knows lots of people with an MLS, Ola, you're a better librarian than all of us. Shout out to Nathaniel. Oh, Nathaniel. Mwah. <laughs> well, ladies, um, does anybody else want to stab at that? Asma, you ain't got nothing? <laughs> um, well, once I can get to the point where I'm not paying out of pocket for books, <laughs> maybe, you know, that, that'll be a nice step right there. So that's real. Well, um, thank you all so much. It's a little before 2.30. I think this has been a wonderful conversation and I'm so grateful to each of you for your time this afternoon um, and to everyone who has come and had this conversation and journey with us the last hour and a half. Um, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. So excited. Also, if you're in New York and feeling up to it, I am um, producing an event called Interdependence Day today. Um, I'm a part of a collective called The Blacksmiths. We're partnering with another collective called The Wide Awakes. Um, of course, if you're coming out, masks, 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 face shields, whatever, just make sure you're protecting yourself and being safe. Uh, but we will have live music, performances, um, uh, a few s films will be screened as well. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be great. And I gotta go so I can go do that. <laughs> um, and I'm emceeing, so that'll be fun. Um, thank you all again so, so much. Have a fantastic day, be safe. Um, please remember that today is the 4th of July. It means it's another day, oh. but also... Emma, someone said repeat what you just said about your event in the chat. I don't even see that. Um, okay, so yeah, today <laughs> is July 4th, as we know. Um, this event is called Interdependence Day. And ultimately, you know, we know that the promise of America has not been for us. We already know that, right? Um, and so the, the goal, and us calling this event Inter Interdependence Day, is to aspire to that promise and to really um, think through the ways that these colonial structures don't work anymore. And they never worked. They never worked for us. They were not intended to work for us. And so how do we then create connections and center Black life and center Black culture and center Black morality um, in what we do moving forward? How do we... It's at Washington Square Park. <laughs> Thank you. Said, where is it? It's at Washington yeah, Square Park. Yeah, it's at Washington Square Park. We'll be near the arch. So that starts at four, four o'clock. Um, so come through if you are feeling able to do so. Yeah, and follow the Free Black Women's Library on Instagram. Yes, until I get follow until everybody. I get, follow until it I get, all. <laughs> until I get banned again. <laughs> Become a Patreon so you can have access to exclusive content like podcasts and free yoga classes led by me. Woo -woo. Oh yeah, because she be teaching yoga, y'all. She be teaching yoga. Oh, nice. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. I look forward to being back again next week with a whole new group of guests. Thanks again to Tiffany, Asma, and Olaronke. I hope that you all have a beautiful weekend. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye. Bye. Ciao.